morning and happy Easter. I titled the service today, Hopping Down the Bunny Trail, because when you look at the history of this holy day, you can't help but look at all of it. The traditions, the names and celebrations that include the holy Christian story of Jesus' death, the hiding of colored eggs brought by a rabbit, the proper way to eat peeps, and the connection with the Jewish Passover. It's all very confusing until you begin to understand where each piece comes from and why in itself it's precious. My name is Annie Furster, and I minister here at First Jefferson Unitarian Universalist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. Welcome to our Easter celebration this morning. I hope there's something here for everyone. How do you and your family celebrate Easter? Let us begin our worship with music. Our call to worship this morning was written by the Reverend Elizabeth Strong. Out of the earth rises light, rises life, rises spring. May we join with the miracle that is springtime and enter into life with lightness and joy. Out of spirit rises faith, rises hope, rises love. May we join with the miracle that is Easter time and enter into faith with hope and love. Let us rise up with spring. Let us rise up with the Spirit and enter into renewed life as we gather into our time of worship together this Easter morning. Our opening hymn is number 1060 in the Keel hymnal, As We Sing of Hope and Joy. As we sing of hope and joy today, some know only anguish and despair. How can we lift our voices in this way while our path pain and misery to spare? If a crumbling world we would renew, we must sing no ordinary song. Views from a noisy gong will never do. In every breath, compassion must be. 
days on which we recall the old stories, we light a flame. For Passover, which reminds us of the courage and strength of those seeking freedom in the past, we light a flame. For Easter, which reminds us that love is our greatest challenge, we light a flame. For gathering today in this sacred space, we light the flame of our chalice. We light the chalice for the opportunity to be together as a community, to remember the past, to plan for our future, to be alive in our present. Please join me in love is the doctrine of this church, quest of truth is our sacrament, and service is our prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedoms, to serve others in community to the end that all souls shall grow into harmony with creation, thus do we covenant with one another. I have two questions this morning. My first is, how do you celebrate Easter, which I already asked you in the introduction? And the second is, why? I know that second question may surprise you, but think about it. If your answer to the first includes chicken's eggs of unnatural coloration, gift-bearing rabbits, and a large ham or lamb dinner, where did all those pieces come from that speak Easter to us? And speaking of origins, when and where did the name Easter arise? And what does it even mean? But speaking of rabbits, I have a story for all ages about a very clever rabbit who, bel um, belittled for his size, managed to triumph with his brain. How the rabbit fooled the elephant and the whale. One day, Brother Rabbit was running along in the sand, lippity-lippity-lippity. He was going to a fine cabbage field. On the way, he saw the whale and the elephant talking together. Brother Rabbit said, I'd like to know what they're talking about. So he crouched down behind some bushes, and he listened. And this is what Brother Rabbit heard the whale say. You are the biggest thing on the land, Brother Elephant, and I am the biggest thing in the sea. If we work together, we can rule all the animals in the world. We can have our own way with everything. Very good, very good, trumpeted the elephant. That suits me. You keep the sea, and I will keep the land. That's a bargain, said the whale as he swam away. Brother Rabbit laughed to himself. They won't rule me, he said as he ran off. Well, Brother Rabbit soon came back with a very long and a very strong rope and a big drum. He hid the drum in some bushes, and then taking one end of the rope, he walked up to the elephant. Oh, dear Mr. Elephant, he said, you are big and strong. Will you have the kindness to do me a small favor? 
The elephant was very pleased, and he trumpeted, Certainly, certainly, what is it? Well, my cow is stuck in the mud in the shore, and I can't pull her out, said Brother Rabbit. If you will help me, you will do me a great service. You are so strong, and I'm sure you could get her out. Oh, certainly, certainly, trumpeted the elephant. Thank you, said the rabbit. Take this rope in your trunk, and I will tie the other end to my cow, and then I will beat my drum to let you know when to pull. You must pull as hard as you can, for that cow is very heavy. Huh, trumpeted the elephant. I'll pull her out or break the rope. The brother rabbit tied the rope to the elephant's trunk and ran off, lippity, lippity, lippity. And he ran till he came to the shore where the whale was. Making a bow, Brother Rabbit said, Oh, mighty and wonderful whale, will you do me a favor? What is it? asked the whale. My cow is stuck in the mud in the shore, said Brother Rabbit, and I cannot pull her out. Of course, you can do it if you would be so kind as to help me. I shall be very much obliged. Well, certainly, said the whale, certainly. Thank you, said Brother Rabbit. Take hold of this rope and I will tie the other end to my cow, and then I will beat my big drum to let you know when to pull. You must pull as hard as you can, for my cow is very, very heavy. Oh, never fear, said the whale. I could pull a dozen cows out of the mud. Oh, I'm sure you could, said the rabbit politely. Only be sure to be gentle, then pull harder and harder till you get her out. The rabbit ran away into the bushes where he had hidden the drum, and he began to beat it. And then the whale began to pull, and the elephant began to pull. And in a minute, the rope would tighten till it was stretched as hard as a bar of iron. This is a very heavy cow, said the elephant. I'll pull her out. Bracing his forefeet in the earth, he gave a tremendous pull. But the whale had no way to brace himself. Dear me, he said, that cow must surely be stuck tight. And lashing his tail in the water, he gave a marvelous pull. He pulled harder, the elephant pulled harder, and soon the whale found himself sliding toward the land. He was so provoked with the cow that he went head first down to the bottom of the sea. That was quite a pull. The elephant was jerked off of his feet, and he came slipping and sliding toward the sea, and he was very angry. That cow must be very strong to drag me in this way, he said. I will brace myself. And kneeling down on the ground, he twisted the rope around his trunk, and then he began to pull his very best. And soon the whale came up out of the water, and then each saw that the other had hold of the rope. How is this, cried the whale. I thought I was pulling Brother Rabbit's cow. That is what I thought, said the elephant. Brother Rabbit is making fun of us. He must pay for this. I will forbid him to eat even one blade of grass on land because he played this trick on us. And the whale said, I will not allow him to drink a drop of water in the sea. But the little rabbit sat in the bushes and laughed and laughed and laughed. Much do I care, he said. I can get all the green things I want from the farmer's garden, and I don't like salt water. And then he laughed some more happy story for this Easter morning. Well, after that story, I'm beginning to see why Easter traditions might include a rabbit delivering eggs instead of the chicken that laid them. In many traditional stories, rabbits are pictured as very clever, smarter even than most of the humans in the story. Think of the tales of Br'er Rabbit or Peter Rabbit outwitting foxes and farmers alike. But really, how did a religious holy day from the Christian tradition come to include so many disparate characters and activities that have nothing to do with Jesus or religion? This may surprise you. The answer goes back even before the Christian story began. You see, the name Easter comes from Estra, a chief goddess of England before the Christian era. She gave her name to the season of planting and blossoming, called Estramonath in Old English. Since the people there were already celebrating Estra, the early Christians decided to keep the name and simply included with it the story of Jesus and his death. 
Jesus rose from his tomb, they said, just as the flowers arise from the bare ground in the spring, or estramona. At first, Easter was celebrated on the 14th day of Nisan in the Jewish calendar, along with Passover, an important Jewish holiday. I'll have more to say about that later. But at the Council of Nicaea in 325 of the Common Era, the Emperor Constantine and his bishops declared that the holy day should be celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon of the vernal equinox. And so it is today, moving around the calendar between March 25th and April 25th, tied to the moon as if to the rope the elephant and the whale pulled. You may be surprised to hear that Easter was not a popular holiday in early America, at least not among the New England Puritans. To them, it was already too tainted with non-Christian influences and an excuse for drinking too much and being rowdy. It wasn't until the 19th century that Easter became an accepted social holiday, a time when people could gather as families, a time when children were at the center of their attention. Now, until that time, children were considered to be small adults who hadn't earned their status yet. They were kind of lumped together with members of the lower orders, like servants and apprentices. Once they were freed from that reckoning, they had to be given festivals to entertain them. Easter eggs and the Easter bunny became popular in those changing times. Decorated eggs, of course, had been part of the spring celebration since medieval times, symbols of new and emerging life. Their elaborate decorations had become almost a contest each year. Early church missionaries adapted Easter eggs to describe their religious stories and the colors took on new meanings. Yellow stood for the resurrection, blue for love, and red was for the blood of Christ. Scenes from the Bible were sometimes painted on the eggs, and the children who found them were encouraged to retell the stories they depicted. Ideas became entwined, hard to separate. Does the blue egg stand for love of life or the love of Christ? And the answer is probably yes to both. But where did the rabbits come in? I think we can thank our German immigrants for that, as we can thank them for many of our secular Christmas traditions. The Easter hare had been bringing the well-behaved children of Germany decorated eggs since early in the 17th century. Rabbits had a reputation of, well, of breeding like rabbits, their powers of fertility rivaling the resurrection of grasses, bulbs, and trees. So not for their intelligence, then, were they included in this Easter ritual, but for their fecundity. O oh, spring, thou art a season of surprises and superstitions. But there's more. Eggs are not the only food connected to Easter celebrations. Why, in my family, the relatives gathered around a grand feast of ham, sweet potatoes, and coleslaw. Ham was often the center of Easter dinners because it symbolizes good luck in many cultures around the world. Some historians believe that Easter's place in the calendar connected it to a time when farmers typically slaughtered their pigs in the fall and then took several months to smoke the pork, making the ham ready just in time for Easter dinner. But lamb is a close rival, as lambs were often sacrificed as an offering to God and were a regular part of the Passover feast. Since Jesus died during Passover, he became known as the Lamb of God, and the animal became a potent symbol for many Christians. And of course, there is always chocolate at Easter. Why, in my family, chocolate was the candy of choice when celebrating Easter. Chocolate eggs, chocolate rabbits, chocolate kisses. Nothing was forbidden as long as it had chocolate in it. I don't know its connection to the Easter myth. It might just have been a clever marketing ploy. When I moved to Ohio in Cincinnati, I discovered another Easter candy tradition I hadn't yet uncovered in my previous experiences. Peeps. If you don't know, peeps are marshmallow candies made in the shape of tiny chickens in nauseating colors. Uh-oh, you've discovered one of my biases. 
I do not like peeps. There are two camps of how to prepare peeps for consumption. No, wait, there's three, actually. The first says you must open the package days before the holiday and let them dry out until they are very hard. They are better and chewier then. The second says you heat them in the microwave until they are soft and mushy before you eat them. And the third says open the package and then throw them in the garbage if somebody buys you some and with mistaken generosity. In Cincinnati, every year, one could read arguments about how to bite them. Heads off first, or heads saved for last. Some traditions are simply unexplainable. But I think my part of Easter tradition was always the Easter parade. I have to admit that I looked forward every Easter to a new dress and a hat. I recall begging my mother to buy me patent leather shoes with buckles. I usually got the dress and the hat along with a pair of white gloves, but never the shiny black shoes. Purchasing a new holiday outfit may seem like a 20th century commercial invention, but even early Christians followed the practice of wearing new clothes for Easter. It was the one time of year when, if you had new clothes, you wore them. You dressed in your finest to go to church as a manner of honoring the resurrected Savior, say historians. It didn't take long for clothing entrepreneurs to encourage the idea. Citygoers went to New York's Fifth Avenue to show off their new attire and eventually led to the creation of the famous Easter Parade. Next, I want to take a look at some of our religious traditions that abound about Easter. But for now, a stewardship report from our stewardship chair, Dan Sexton. Good morning. Hope everyone is doing all right. I'm chair of the stewardship committee and wanted to give everybody an update. Our pledge goal this year is 153,000, and so far we've received 80,000, and that's a 10% increase for those pledges we've received. And that's very encouraging to me. Thanks to everybody who's made their pledge. If you've not made your pledge and are still thinking about it, I ask you to think about what we want for our, the future of our church. Inspiring Sunday services, a strong religious education program for youth and adults, a welcoming church that mixes in newcomers to our church family. To do that, we need to commit our money and our time. One thing I've enjoyed so much is volunteering in the Youth RE, teaching Sunday school classes and working with the, the teen youth group. A great thing about that is the feeling of family I get when I hear that a, a kid I taught in Sunday school is uh, graduating high school, graduating college, getting married, that they're making their way in life and that this church was a part of shaping them. I love it when I see them posting on each other's Facebook pages because it means they're still pals with the friends they made in this church and that those, are, those kids are part of our extended family. I think we will find the resources that we need so that when this church opens up again, we will be that signing with that shining church that we want. When people visit, they will feel the spirit of family that we have and want to be a part of it. I ask you to give generously of your time and your money to make that happen. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Dan. The Reverend Lisa Fishbeck is an Episcopal priest and the launching vicar of the Church of the Advocate in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. She wrote this reading this morning. It began with a stone. When some people think of Easter, they think of a bunny rabbit. Others would point to other fertility symbols and signs of spring, springing forth out of the ordinary, the plain, the seemingly dead, butterflies, <clears throat> flowers, and the like. Christians might think of the empty cross or of a cross with flowers on it, 
the instrument of shameful death transformed into something else. But in the midst of all those other things, I think about the stone, not as a symbol of the resurrection itself, but as a means of reminding us to open ourselves to the journey, to persevere with the understanding and knowing and embracing that life-changing, world-shifting, reality-jolting event. If we want to persist with an Easter bunny, perhaps in addition to the jelly beans and fertility symbols, the Easter bunny might start delivering, delivering geodes, stones that look like one thing, plain enough, but on closer inspection with a lot of perseverance and some hard knocks, reveal the entire and more glorious dimension. The stone in the Easter story reminds us that there is more going on in this resurrection event than any of us first can grasp or understand. The stone reminds us that with God there are possibilities beyond logic, beyond our wisdom, beyond our puny known world. The stone reminds us that in the midst of death, we are in life. Hallelujah. Join us in our hymn number 269, Lo, the Day of Days. Lo, the day of days is here. As fascinating as the secular traditions of Easter are to me, so too are the religious ones. And they are as varied as their counterparts, but just as easily explained. Let's start with Passover. Early Easter rituals were once tacked on to this historic event and were not completely separated until the Council of Nicaea in 325 of the Common Era. Passover is the oldest and most important religious festival in Judaism, commemorating God's deliverance of the Hebrews from slavery in Egypt 
and his creation of the Israelite people. According to the website crossover.com, the festival of Passover begins at sunset on the 14th of Nisan, usually in March or April, and marks the beginning of a seven-day celebration which includes the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This year, it began yesterday at sunset. The highlight of Passover is a communal meal called Seder, which means order because of the fixed order of the service, <clears throat> which, is a time, which is a time to rejoice and celebrate the deliverance for the Hebrews that God accomplished through the Exodus. The Egyptians had feared that the Jews would flourish and overtake them and decided to conquer them first and enslave them. When they did so, the firstborn son of every family was to be slain according to law in order to keep the strength of the people in check. The story of Moses being hidden away and saved from this law is just one part of that story. Moses' job was to free the Hebrews from this enslavement. They prayed, and their God sent ten plagues to the Egyptians. But he first told Moses to have the Israelites sacrifice a lamb to him and mark the door frames of their homes with the lamb's blood. God would send the angel of death to Egypt, and it would pass over the households that were marked by the blood of the lamb. The Seder, a commemorative and celebratory dinner filled with the history of this event, is both solemn and joyful, a testimony to bravery and to love. Because Jesus was crucified during the season of Passover, early Christians continued to celebrate this holiday for more than 300 years. <clears throat> but today's Christians' celebrations of Easter begin with 40 days of Lent, a time of planning, of praying, and of fasting. The six Sundays during Lent are days to break the fast and enjoy feasts in anticipation of Easter Sunday. The 40 days of Lent reflect the importance of 40-day events in the Bible, like Moses on the mountain with God out of Exodus 24, Elijah's travel to meet with God, 1 Kings 19, and Jesus' time facing temptation in the wilderness in Matthew 4. Ash Wednesday is the official start of Lent. A pastor or priest smudges ash on churchgoers' foreheads to symbolize our lives which are mortal and temporary. We are made of dust and filled with life breathed from God, says Genesis. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Lent symbolizes that we will die someday, but that's not the end of the story. When we're mindful that life is short, it inspires us to make the most of our lives. You have 40 days each year to think about that, if you will. Holy Week, also known as Passion Week, includes the final days the Bible records of Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection. It begins with Palm Sunday, named for the way people welcome Jesus into Jerusalem, placing palm branches on the road as a sign of honor because they believed he was the king, the Messiah that they had been waiting for. And it ends with Good Friday, the day Jesus was betrayed, arrested, put on trial, crucified and buried. His friends went home overwhelmed by fear and believing all was lost. But Easter Sunday marks the day in the story that Jesus was resurrected and appeared to several witnesses, his friends and family. It's a celebration that Jesus is alive to Christians, that sin is defeated, and that he has the power to make all things new. It's why the ch Christian church exists. It's the answer to the question of whether good will triumph over evil, if our worst mistakes will hold us back, and if the difficult times we endure are worth the effort we give. Christians believe they don't get to experience the power of a changed life and belonging to something larger than themselves unless they go through the same pain and suffering that Jesus endured. I think it's important to us as religious people of faith to understand the holy days and traditions of other faiths, including those that are part of our own historical beginnings. I'll say more of that after we come back from 
saying the communion of names and milestones. As Dan Sexton said, we are in the midst of raising money for this church to continue the things that are important to us, the things that we hold dear and holy. And I think this is a good week to think about that kind of sacrifice that we give for our church, the time we spend, the money we donate, the um, the attention we pay to the details of community, of loving one another, of caring about one another. I don't have any individual stories to share today about what's going on with our congregation, and I'm hoping that means that all is well with you. And I think that maybe that's the way that we should just look at today and think about and celebrate and those of us who are in pain and concern can let us know, and we will consider those stories in absentia as well. Let us take a moment of silence and meditation to consider this beloved community, what it means to each of us, what it means to those outside of the community as we try to do outreach with love and comfort. And then we'll listen to some music as we meditate. Thank you, Misha. Unitarians and Universalists come from a long history of liberal Christian faith. If you missed the service last week when I talked about that history, you can find it on YouTube under the title, Lo, the Earth Awakes Again. Our history took us down a different path than more conservative churches followed. The Unitarians early on objected to the way that Christian churches interpreted the Bible. They mainly objected to the story of the Trinity because it isn't in the Christian Testament, 
but was voted into worship formalities in that famous 4th century council. They also objected to the suggestion that only clergy were able to interpret the stories in the Bible and claimed that they used it to control people rather than set them free to discover how to interpret their own lives. The Universalists objected to the limited interpretation of salvation that did not include all people and wanted to extend their good news of a loving God to all people of faith. These ideas were not popular with more conservative denominations, and both the Unitarians and Universalists were often ridiculed as heretics. But people came to our historic faiths as come-outers from faiths that did not meet their needs or objected to their way of life. Other people sought a more inclusive way to celebrate faith. In those times, we taught that people should be accepted not only for who they were, but how they believed and celebrated their beliefs. Condemning variations in faith and belief was never part of our teaching. Some factions of today's Unitarian Universalist churches have come to see their evolving faith as the only way to believe and to reject the historic traditions of the churches they left or never belonged to or understood as wrong-headed or inconsequential. We have become known in places as heretics again, but as unbelievers, believing in nothing at all. I believe we cannot be a caring people, a loving people, a people who believe in universal freedom of religion, justice and equity for all, and loving kindness, unless and until we understand the heartbeat of other faiths and the traditions that sustain them. They may not be the answer for us, but neither are we the religion of one size fits all. Just as we cannot accept and appreciate mythological creatures like rabbits that deliver decorated eggs and other secular traditions of Easter, we must appreciate the history, the traditions, and the faiths that brought us to this point in our own faith. We are not free to believe in our own traditions until that freedom belongs to everyone. And we are not worthy to call ourselves Unitarian Universalists until we understand the importance and significance of the sources from which we draw our heritage and our strength. From direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to the renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces that create and uphold life and wisdom from the world's religions, which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life. Let us, as our sources say, be grateful for the religious pluralism which enriches and ennobles our faith inspired to deepen our understanding and expand our vision. Happy Easter, everyone. Let us begin here. Please join us in singing our final hymn, number 1058, Be Ours a Religion. We lit extra candles today as we started to celebrate Easter. We lit them to help us recall the old stories that brought us here. We lit them to celebrate Passover as part of the tradition of this time of year. We lit one for Easter. And of course, we lit our chalice, which stands for so many things dear to our heart, the love beloved community, a beacon of light and hope. And we extinguish that because we take it with us in our hearts. 
and our mind. For holy days in which we recall, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong thing. I reading, should be reading the benediction. Because of those who came before us, we are. In spite of their failings, we believe. Because of and in spite of the horizons of their vision, we too dream. Let us go today remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to love mightily, and to bow to the mysteries of life. So may it be in all our lives.